If you look on the chart, you find there are these two elements that are particularly interesting. One of them is called uranium. It's found in nature. Uranium has this, again, think of a flea, think of a, uh, a flea or a mosquito in the midst of Memorial Stadium. And there's the nucleus. And it has 92 protons. It's uranium-238. What that means, with 238, that's called the atomic weight. Now, all the weight is in the neutrons and in the protons. But if you subtract 92 from this, you find 146 neutrons. It has that many protons, that many neutrons. The neutrons have no electric charge, but they serve as a glue. At the same time, you put too many of them in there, or you don't put them in the right place, and the nucleus can become radioactive. This is radioactive. Uranium-238 is radioactive with a, with a half-life of uh, billions of years. Let's look at uranium-235. What's the difference? It's still uranium. That means it still has 92 electrons. It's still uranium. That means it still has 92 protons. These little mosquito-like things in the center that have all of the mass. A proton weighs about 2,000 times as much as an electron. So an electron is there. It does have some mass, but it's really tiny. 92 protons. So, it, but it has three fewer neutrons. That's 143 neutrons. Turns out uranium-235 is radioactive. It has a half-life of about a billion years. Go back to the beginning of the solar system, and there was lots of this stuff. It was abundant. And then it started decaying. After one billion years, there was only one half as much. After another billion years, only half of that. After another billion years, only half of that. After another billion years, only half of that. And here we are. And so it turns out that uranium-235 is about 0.7% of your ordinary uranium just because it's mostly decayed away. This is decayed away, too, but it has a longer half-life, so not much of it is gone. So these are called different isotopes. And we can say, here's one isotope of uranium, here's another. This one is a rare isotope, not really rare, 0.7%. That's not tiny rare. It's enough there so you can do something with it. Then there's another element. This is one called plutonium. It's over here. It's done in light colors. That's because it, it doesn't exist naturally. Uh, it turns out cosmic rays and, and, and radioactive decay can produce tiny little bits of it, but basically it's not there. It was first produced here on this campus by Glenn Seaborg. And he had to make it, make it from other lighter elements by adding neutrons, getting decays, and so on, putting it together. He found this is a plutonium. Plutonium-239 is a very interesting one. There's another one, plutonium-238, which is actually harder to make. This one has a half-life of 24,000 years. Plutonium-238, which has one less neutron, has a property that its half-life is 80 years. Not only that, but its radioactive decay is alpha particles. Alpha particles are really nice. See, they don't even get through your skin, as long as you don't breathe them in. But these are the famous ones, uranium-235 and plutonium-239. This has a half-life of about a billion years. But they both share a property that is key to the rest of this lecture. And that's the following. Suppose you have a neutron coming from somewhere. You can make a neutron. There are several ways to make a neutron. And you'll see one of the atomic bomb designs, I will, uh, atomic bomb design I will show you, has a little thing in the middle to make neutrons to make the bomb work. If that neutron comes to uranium and hits the nucleus, it could stick to the nucleus. Certain probability it will stick. If it does that, we no longer have uranium-235. We have uranium-236. Now, here's the key feature of uranium-236. It becomes highly radioactive. Its half-life, um, the, the number is probably less than a billionth of a second. And it doesn't just give off an alpha particle. It explodes with something called fission. The nucleus breaks into two pieces, and they go flying apart. They're repelling each other. Once it breaks, once that nuclear force is broken by that extra neutron going in just the wrong place, the two sides break apart. We get these two pieces flying out. 
the pieces that come flying out are called fission fragments. Now, you take any nucleus and break it up into two random pieces, and the odds are those fission fragments will be radioactive. And in fact, most fission fragments are radioactive. That's called the nuclear debris or the nuclear waste. But anyway, a neutron comes in here. It, it doesn't smash it apart. This thing is almost coming apart anyway. It's held together by the nuclear forces. That neutron comes in there and just unbalances those nuclear forces in such a way that this thing flies apart immediately into two pieces. Plutonium, the same way. What happens is if a neutron hits this, by the way, it's not easy to get a neutron to hit the nucleus. Think of it. It's like shooting a bullet into Memorial Stadium and trying to hit that mosquito. Most of the time, you miss. But when you do hit, the mosquito breaks up, releases enormous energy, and you get two fission fragments. Fission fragments, radioactive debris, that's very dangerous. Leads to nuclear waste and nuclear fallout. Now, here's the discovery that makes this thing suddenly exciting, fearsome, dangerous, useful. Not only do you get two fission fragments coming about, but on average from the uranium, you get two neutrons coming out too. Plutonium. You get three neutrons coming out on average. When this was discovered, it was seen as the key to the chain reaction. A chain reaction is, well, you got this thing, and you send one neutron in, you can get the neutron from beryllium. This thing fissions, out come two neutrons. Ah, suppose you put enough uranium around here. Well, you have to put a lot because it misses most of the nuclei, right? So if I just have one next to it, it'll probably miss. It's like hitting a mosquito in Memorial Stadium. So you put more and more and more and more, and you put enough of them in there so that it's likely to hit. If you do that, that's called a critical mass. When we say the critical mass of something, you have to recognize it, 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 it's not just so many kilograms. It's also the geometry. The first atomic bomb on Hiroshima worked in the following way. Two pieces, each piece was less than a critical mass. This was put inside of a gun, called a gun design. An ordinary explosive, not gunpowder, but probably some, something called a high explosive was put in here. The way it worked was they detonated the high explosive. This piece went flying towards this piece. When they came together, you had a critical mass. At that point, you had two pieces that when a neutron came, now this neutron goes and causes a fission. Out come two neutrons. Each one of those causes a fission. Two, four. And now you ask, how many times do you have to double? You go from one to two to four, eight, 16, 32, 64, uh, 128, 256, 512. After 10 additional steps, you're up 1,000. A factor of 1,000. That's after 10 steps. 10 steps later, you have another factor of 1,000 in the number of neutrons. You have a million. That's another 10 steps. Another 10 steps, you have a billion. Another 10 steps, you have a trillion. By the time you get up to about 75 steps, you have Avogadro's number. That means basically every nucleus in that uranium has, has fissioned and released its energy. The energy being a million times greater than an equal weight of TNT. So there's your atomic bomb. That's how it works. Here's the surprising thing about the uranium bomb, and this is really important if you want to understand terrorism, what's going on in Iraq, Iran, and, 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 and North Korea. This bomb was never tested. Why wasn't it tested? Well, because we used up all the uranium we had. Why? Because it turns out uranium is very, very hard to get. Uranium-235, as I'll explain, that it has to be made out of uranium-235. Uranium-238 pollutes it. It keeps it from exploding. You have to purify it. You have to have almost pure uranium-235. And that was very hard to do. Secondly, this thing is such a simple design. Everybody was pretty sure it would work. The design was easy. Look at it. The hard part of the uranium bomb is getting the uranium. Plutonium is different. 
Plutonium, it turned out, requires a much more sophisticated design. That a plutonium bomb requires an implosion. So let me show you a design of an implosion bomb. Uh, this was done by a real expert. And a couple of interesting features about this bomb. It's round, of course. And, and the roundness is what you do for an implosion. What you want, an implosion means you, you surround this thing with explosives. So when the explosives go out, they also push this thing in and compress it. That's called an implosion. Very hard to do. Try squeezing a water balloon. You see the problem. You squeeze it here, it comes out between your fingers. So the implosion has to be exceedingly uniform. Very difficult to do. This uses a more, this is a somewhat sophisticated advanced design. Uses what's what are called explosive lenses. Basically the idea is you trigger, see there are 32 detonators. So you have to fire them all off simultaneously. That's hard to do. Uh, so you get these detonators to all go off at the same time. They begin causing an explosion that goes inward now. But it, with these shapes, these things that are, that are called the, the lenses, <clears throat> what you do is you make the explosion go in just such a way that it comes to get together into a perfect sphere just as it's coming in. This is a tricky thing to do. This is not the sort of bomb a typical terrorist group is going to put together. You get a really high-tech country, such as, I don't know, the United States, Britain, France, Israel. Or you get a low-tech country that's willing to give up feeding its people in order to put all of its money into becoming a small high-tech sector on, on nuclear explosives. And, and you pay us, you know, get, get really top people and, you know, help everybody else, let them starve. So these, this is where you worry. But a terrorist group isn't, isn't going to do this, in my opinion. This is too hard to do. So this is the most elaborate accurate design I was able to find that's unclassified. The reason that I was able to show you this is simply that this was, was not a U.S. design. This was a design that was drawn for the Senate by Khalid Hamza, who was the bomb designer for Saddam Hussein. He defected, I think, in 1995. I think that was when it was. You, you can see why the U.S. intelligence agency drew the wrong conclusion that Saddam Hussein was deeply involved in this. He had done this in 1995 at a time when he claimed to be abiding by the treaty but wasn't allowing full inspections. He never did allow full inspections. That's why it came as a shock to many of us when there actually were no bombs or even components of bombs that we could find in Iraq because as recently as 1995, this chief bomb designer who defected actually knew a lot about the bomb design and they were doing tests. So, uh, give people a little bit of slack when they say that they mis were mistaken. There was a lot of reason to think there were bombs being designed there. The problem with making a plutonium bomb is making the implosion work. I want you to know that. That's the difficulty. That's very hard. That's very high tech. And it's a high tech that you don't just get in the typical engineering school. The problem with the uranium bomb is getting the uranium, so let me say a few words about that. 